good afternoon. Welcome to tonight's IBM Centennial Lecture on pioneering the science of knowledge to be delivered by the Director of IBM Research and IBM Senior Vice President, Dr. John E. Kelly. My name is Glenn Davis, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, and I'd like to begin proceedings in our customary way by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet this evening, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. I'd also, on a more prosaic note, uh, invite you to turn off your phones and pages <coughs> because this lecture will be filmed and broadcast and uh, the audience probably wants to hear from John Kelly <laughs> rather than that fabulous tune that you picked up and used as your tone. From the University of Melbourne's perspective, I'd like to say that it's an honour to welcome Dr Kelly and many of his colleagues from IBM on a much anticipated two-day visit to Melbourne and Australia. A partnership between IBM and the university has been developing in very exciting directions in recent years with a range of research initiatives touching on ICT, the life sciences, smarter cities, sustainability, the bionic eye and much, much more. And in that context, I'd particularly like to acknowledge the presence this evening of Professor Peter Rathjen, now the Vice Chancellor of the University of Tasmania, but uh, a much admired colleague of ours as we put this relationship together which began in 2007. It established a relationship of continuous exploration, open to people from different parts of IBM and the university, interested in working collaboratively on research, on learning, and on engagement. And for both IBM and the university, this was our first ever whole of university relationship. It's not about one faculty, one school, one program. It's about everything we do at this institution. This week's visit by Dr. Kelly coincides with a series of important events in this developing partnership, including tomorrow's opening of the IBM R&D lab in Australia at 204 Ligon Street. Another centrally important event is tonight's centennial lecture. The lecture forms part of a series IBM is sponsoring at important campus locations around the world in this, the hundredth year since the formation of the company in 1911. IBM has an extraordinary and diverse history as an information technology company, yet I think one of the most interesting phases of this rich history is what's happening in IBM today. IBM CEO and President Sam Pasmanio has described the recent turn in the company from being a traditional multinational to becoming a globally integrated enterprise. With the rise of supercomputing and the rapid expansion of knowledge in many fields, one of IBM's main aims now is to turn big data into big insight, as the CEO put it. With this fascinating history and exciting present in mind, tonight's lecture by Dr. John Kelly will explore pioneering the science of information. So to deliver the IBM Centennial Lecture, please join me in welcoming Senior Vice President and Director of IBM Research, Dr. John E. Kelly. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here at the university, be here in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, as Glenn mentioned, uh, IBM is celebrating its centennial this year, uh, which is, uh, in industrial terms, uh, not a trivial task. In the high-tech industry, it's a very rare occasion. In fact, uh, the body count is one after 100 years. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, this afternoon is talk about uh, IT and where IT is going and, and many of the technologies that I think will change, change the world. There's no doubt that information technology has played a critical role in the evolution of society in, in the last century. Go back uh, nearly 100 years to tabulating machines uh, and punch cards, mechanical devices that were used to transform many aspects of our businesses. Go back 50 years to the IBM 360, which really revolutionized a number of different businesses, whether it's the airline business, the banking uh, industry, uh, the telecom industry, et cetera. Or go back 30 years to the personal computer and how that brought IT out of the glass house into the hands of all of us and began to advance uh, computing in society in a, in a much different way. Go back just 10 or 15 years to the internet, which really, in a sense, interconnected and flattened the world and began to transform uh, not only businesses, but many aspects of our life to today when 
technology is ubiquitous. It's in all of our pockets. It is a constant communication device. And uh, just recently, machines such as the Watts and the insignia in the lower right that I'll talk about in a few minutes uh, are a glimpse at where information technology is going in the future. So this technology revolution that's occurred over the last century uh, has played a vital role in transforming businesses and society. And as I said, we're 100 years old, and we like to think that we played a major role in much of that transformation over the last century. Uh, going back to the punch card, the System 360 that I mentioned, some of these insignias you may or may not recognize, the hard disk drive in the middle. IBM invented the hard disk drive, invented many of the technologies that created the storage that we carry around uh, in our de personal devices today. Uh, and we even embraced some very revolutionary different technologies, the, the Penguin, uh, Linux, open source. We, we embraced an open source technology that was, in a sense, very threatening to our core business, but we saw it as the future of the development of software and operating systems. I point to the upper right one because it's really the origin of IBM research, and I think it's relevant to where we stand today. IBM research was founded at Columbia University in New York City. The first research center that Mr. Watson, our founder, created was at a university because he realized that this is where the intellectual horsepower was, and this is where you need to do research. You need to be associated with great universities. And that model today is the model we most often follow when we open new research labs around the world. And this is our current uh, CEO and chairman, Sam Palmisano. Uh, in a speech that he gave uh, during our centennial at the uh, Computer History Museum. And I think that this is a very interesting statement for uh, one of the top uh, Fortune 5 CEOs in the world to make. And here he recognizes that R and D play a very, very significant role in our corporation. And, and, I th and I think in a sense that he would recognize that this is why IBM is still here after 100 years in the technology industry and perhaps many others have failed. And it's this nature of both R and D and its importance that we think is incredibly relevant. Now, I'm often asked, well, John, why is IBM research still alive and growing and in a vital place when many of your competitors' research organizations um, are long since gone? The, the Bell Labs, the Hitachi Central Research, the Xerox Parks. And I think there's a few reasons, but I think the most important reason is that the research and innovation culture is fundamental to our business model. We have decided as a company that we will compete based on innovation as opposed to other business models which may be supply, supply chain, low cost, uh, et cetera. We have decided as a company for 100 years that we will compete based on innovation. The minute you make that decision, you have to excel at research and you have to put your money where your mouth is. And this gentleman does that. This gentleman puts $6 billion a year into R&D, which is, I think, the largest in, uh, certainly in our industry. Uh, but fundamentally believes in both. Let me translate that into sort of now the beginnings of the, the technical uh, presentation. Uh, I've, in our centennial, sort of sat back and looked at uh, technology and the growth of technology in our industry uh, over the decades. And it's very clear to me that the exponential growth in the, in the capabilities of our largest computers or our handheld devices is the result over that long period of time of both incremental improvement development and radical innovation, disruptive innovation, that all of these technologies tend to get on these exponential curves. But as you know, no exponential uh, is going to last forever. And so what happens is we get on these technology curves but we reach a point where it plateaus and we need a radical disruptive innovation to take the next step forward. And if you look over decades, or much less a century, you'll see this pattern of continual improvement followed by radical innovation and disruptive technology. And if you, back to Sam's comment, that is nothing more than R and D. 
as you probably have uh, gathered, uh, our agenda has moved from one of back office IT to one that we refer to as smarter, smarter Planet. But this is basically applying uh, information technology to some of the world's most complex systems. And going from basically a reactive mode to a modeled predictive mode. So the problems that we're most interested in studying are not just single systems, but real world systems of systems. Uh, just as in biology, we're made up of systems and of systems, the real world, complex nature, whether it's physical systems, man-made systems, or, or others, are all complex systems of systems. No models exist in, in that right-hand area. And we're very interested in modeling and predicting. And if you look at uh, the left-hand side, it was primarily an analog uh, world. On the right, very much a digital world and very much a statistical world that we need to deal with. Our research centers span the globe, and I think this gives us a tremendous advantage as we do research into these areas of systems of systems. Um, as you can see, we're global. We're very proud that we've been expanding dramatically over the last several years around the globe uh, doing real world research to give you a sense for the kinds of things that we're doing in, the, in these centers that we've recently established. In Dublin, Ireland, a focus on smarter cities. We are co-resident at the city control center with the city management. There is not a separate location. Uh, we're doing traffic management, we're doing uh, disaster recovery, uh, a number of different things there. In Saudi Arabia, we're doing high performance computing around oil discovery and energy generation. I'll talk about the, uh, the uh, different agendas that we have here in Melbourne. In Taiwan, we're very interested in healthcare. There's some very interesting emerging models that are developing uh, on the island of Taiwan. So this gives us a global reach. It gives us a sense of what's going on. It gives us a sense of the art of the possible. It creates a network around the globe for these research labs to, to collaborate. And in a sense, it takes our researchers out of their brick and mortar labs and puts them into the real world. Because as you'll see, many of the problems we're now working on, the, the world is our lab. We cannot create in our laboratories the kinds of environments that we want to study in the real world. So as Glenn mentioned, uh, just a year ago today, we announced that we were going to open a research and development center uh, here in Melbourne in Australia, and we were going to do it associated with the, with the university. Um, interestingly, we also decided that we were going to run an experiment of doing both research and development together co-located with a university, something we've never done before. And what we're attempting to do with this model is do much more rapid transfer of technology and innovation from the research mode into the development of products that we can rapidly deploy around the world. So it's a new model. We're experimenting in R&D uh, in the paradigm itself here in Melbourne. The three areas that we've chosen to do research on here in Melbourne are shown on this slide. Uh, first, and, they're, and in a sense they're obvious, but resource uh, management from the discovery through the supply chain through the operations. Natural disaster management. We just ran a, uh, a whole seminar today on resilient societies. And of course, I don't need to tell you about the impacts of uh, natural disasters on society. How do we sense, how do we predict, how do we model those? How do we go from, um, from predicting to reacting to recovery? All part of what we want to study in that middle column. And then because there's such a tremendous capability around the health sciences and biological sciences here in Australia and here in the Melbourne area, uh, this is an area that is ripe for working closely between our tremendous capability in data, data management, high performance computing with those that are studying healthcare here at the University of Melbourne. <clears throat> and across the bottom, these are the types of areas that we're interested in applying to these kinds of problems. High performance computing, stream computing that's coming in all very rapidly as I'll discuss in a minute, cloud offerings, analytics, et cetera. 
Now I want to bridge to <clears throat> a little bit of the future and talk about what I think are four technologies that are uh, going to be transformative <clears throat> and are going to be the backbone of many of the types of systems that we want to work on and model. Let me begin at the bottom of the chart and talk about nano devices. The computer chips that we use in our most advanced systems today pack roughly one billion transistors on a chip the size of your thumbnail. Tremendous compute power. I remember 30 years ago when I joined IBM, we were struggling to pack 1,000 transistors on a chip, and we're now doing one billion. We are going to experience over the next decade or so another factor of 1,000. We will have over one trillion devices on our semiconductor chips powering our large computing systems. A thousand X, that's hard for the human mind to comprehend. We're used to 10%, 20% or doubling. We're not used to a thousand. The implications of a thousand X are beyond what we can comprehend in terms of the capability of those systems. Going up the stack, computer systems. We now are in the pet, what we call a petascale generation. We are moving up by a factor of 1,000, as I'll show in subsequent charts, to the exascale generation. Exascale being a billion times a billion. In data, we're moving from large terabyte, petabyte data up by a factor of 1,000 to a million to exa and zettabyte uh, databases. And again, as we heard earlier in the symposium, that not structured, unstructured data, which presents a tremendous problem for traditional uh, computing. But it has huge implications. And then at the top, uh, probably most far-reaching but perhaps most interesting, is we are going to go from computer systems that are programmed by humans to computer systems that learn. And I'll talk a little bit about the work we're doing in that area. So these factors of 1,000 or a million or complete changes in paradigms in compute systems are going to have profound impacts in terms of what we're going to be able to do with information technology in the future. So I'd like to talk about each of these uh, sequentially and let me start um, at the bottom. Behind computing for the last hundred years has been some type of switch or device. Over the last century, that switching device has changed from mechanical through electromechanical through uh, vacuum tubes, transistors, integrated circuits that I described. If you look at this semi-log plot, it's, it's, it's incredible what we have done over the last century, right? We have gone up by, what, uh, 15 orders of magnitude. We're entering a regime now in nanotechnology where we're basically assembling atomically and through molecular assembly bottoms up in devices that are measured at the nanoscale. That's going to allow us to, again, achieve trillions of devices uh, in these uh, computer chips. It's interesting, again, to look at this, and I think we're the only one, again, left standing. Uh, we built, in 1911, mechanical systems. We survived every one of these transitions. Not only did we survive, we led as a computer company. And when we stand back and look at this, this uh, curve as a company, if I put the companies on this chart that competed with us in every one of those technologies, you'd see very few of them make it over one transition in technology because they were not doing the research to understand what the technology was going to do next. And so the field would be littered with companies that you would recognize or have heard about uh, in the past. And so when people ask me, well, why are you investing in nanotechnology? Why did you build a $100 million nanotech center in Zurich, Switzerland? It's because we want to not only lead in that generation of technology, but we need to survive the leap uh, over that barrier between those two technologies. Very interestingly, when we work in the nanoscale regime, we also find other applications of the technology beyond computing devices. And I show here just two examples. On the top is something we call a DNA transistor. Uh, and, and this sort of speaks to having an interdisciplinary lab. I have biologists, computer scientists, nanomaterials folks working in the same lab. What our folks came up with is a device which 
uh, it begins to address the challenge of how do we read every individual's human uh, DNA for less than $1,000. Now, why do you want to do that? You want to do that so that you can get the personalized medicine at a very low cost. Well, they invented a device, which is a, a multi-layer device of electrodes with a thin nano pore or hole drilled through it with a, a special laser device constructed in such a way that we can pull a single strand of DNA through that hole and electrically read the DNA. Tremendous advances, and we're working with Roche in partnership to commercialize uh, this device. The bottom is a very interesting, uh, uh, again, side uh, advantage of, of working in some of these materials. We work in nanoscale polymers for obvious reasons of in insulators and uh, other types of materials that we use in these nanoelectronic devices. Uh, our team discovered a set of uh, polymer-based nanoparticle materials, which have, as you can see, <clears throat> uh, on the left is a, um, a bacteria. On the right is a bacteria, uh, and these, by the way, are staph infection bacteria, which are very, very resistant uh, to current um, uh, antibiotics. We discovered a material that we could make with great uniformity in size. We could tailor the electrical charge of the surface of the particle such that it would attach itself to these bacteria, penetrate the wall, and kill the bacteria. So the bacteria can try to mutate as fast as it wants. It makes no difference to this particle. And very interesting, this is a whole class of materials that we think we can uh, develop to address other types of um, bacteria. So, uh, as you might imagine, a number of pharmaceutical companies are interested in that kind of technology. So a little bit off the main, main IT um, line, but I think it's very interesting that when you work in these fields, you never know what you're going to find in adjacent spaces. Moving up to uh, large-scale computing. So as I mentioned, we're going to go up by a factor of 1,000 again. How are we going to do that? The state of the art today is shown on the left. A petasquared system, or a blue gene P, to achieve a petaflop of compute power requires 72 racks, a rack being about the size of a refrigerator. Um, we're shooting for that factor of 1,000 before the end of a decade at exascale. To do that, as you can see, we're shooting for a factor of 1,000 in compute power, but we have tremendous, tremendous uh, energy barriers to overcome. We need to hold it to a factor of about 100x, not 1,000x. These systems today uh, uh, consume megawatts of power. If we don't do something different, these systems on the right will consume gigawatts, and you literally will need a power plant next to a large installation of one of these supercomputer centers. We're working on the technologies both at the processor level, at the memory level, some of the uh, three-dimensional packing of these devices, working on using silicon photonics, light, as opposed to electrons for transport within these systems uh, for reduced power. But we know that we can achieve these numbers. To put that in perspective, what this means is these 72 racks at one petaflop will fit into a third of one rack when we achieve this. 72 into a third of one rack. Now, I don't think anybody's going to buy a third of a rack from us. <laughs> They're going to want to buy 72 racks of that and, and have very large scale systems. But again, it, it's, uh, it's hard for us to comprehend that kind of advance in technology. But it will happen. It will happen. In the step from here to here, we have systems that are in the tens and hundreds of petaflops, or the so-called blue gene Q system, which will be an interim step to these larger exascale generation systems. And that's what the partnership here at the University of Melbourne is about, is using that high performance computing in this collaboratory to generate new types of insights. I like to say that these computer systems are analogous to the microscope. They basically give us insights into the behavior of these molecules uh, that we never had before with traditional microscopes. They also allow us, by the way, to compress time because we can accelerate interactions and run them at real time or faster than real time 
to, to run the uh, experiment. So we're really thrilled to be able to apply our most advanced computing technologies to these biological and healthcare uh, challenges here in Melbourne. Another application of these large supercomputers is in the area that we talked about before, which is natural disaster prediction and prevention. Uh, we have written computer models that give us dramatically improved ability to forecast weather on a much, much finer grain resolution, kilometer resolution, than has ever been achieved before uh, with other computing systems. This, um, we call it deep thunder. This capability is at the core of what we're doing in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, where you recall they had uh, massive rain, mudslides, loss of life uh, some time ago. Uh, this system now is being deployed in Rio and several other cities in Brazil to do very, very localized prediction of weather, water runoff, flood, mudslides. So again, building these systems into a very resilient society in, in a place like Rio. Moving up, up to data. Uh, this is the one you'll notice, it not only is going up by a thousand, but it's going up by a million X. Uh, we are generating data at rates we've never seen before in, in the history of, of mankind. The question is, how are we gonna extract knowledge from something that's that, that large? It's not only going up in size, it's going up in the speed at which it's coming at us. This data is coming at us and requiring processing in milli and sometimes microseconds, fractions of a second. So we literally no longer have the time to take the data, store it on a disk drive, pull it out, do an analysis, and come out with an answer. By the time you do that, you've already been swamped by a tsunami of data that's come over your bow during just that time. And we have some very fast systems getting on and off of disk. So we need real-time processing. So here's the problem <clears throat> that we're facing. We have enormous volumes. I talked about going from terabytes to zettabytes of data. We have that data coming at us from what used to be batch mode to literally streaming data. And we have what used to be structured data in the old sort of banking world of, okay, I've got ones and zeros in columns. I can use relational databases to operate on that to this unstructured data, multimedia data. And the fourth dimension I didn't put on this chart is that the data that we're getting now in these new real world applications is very noisy. It is full of erroneous signals, erroneous data. Um, if you look at the applications of some of this kind of information, Homeland Security is, is an obvious one. Uh, telcos, and I'll get to this one in a second. But look at, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of records per second, whether it's Homeland Security or what's going on in telco networks and some of the largest telcos in the world. When you look at the 50 billion per day, 6 billion, when you look at the response times, you need millisecond decisions in a Homeland Security application, particularly if it's a cyber threat. In some cases, even milliseconds is too late. Your systems are corrupted in, in a few milliseconds. In the case of telcos, and here's a case where we're working with Bharti, it's the largest telco in India, massive, massive uh, uh, wireless traffic. Uh, 10 milliseconds per decision on looking at what their customers are doing and how they want to tune and refine their infrastructure for their wireless network. And then the system, I, I hope by now everyone's heard of this Watson, Watson deep Q&A system that we, uh, that we researched, developed, and demonstrated on this, this game show Jeopardy. But again, this was a system that competed head-to-head -head with humans in an open domain question and answering uh, field. In that case, we had three seconds to beat humans at, at this uh, open domain question. Uh, within three seconds, we had roughly under a second to understand the question, under a second to find the information, and we had about 500 milliseconds to decide whether we were going to bet or not in this, in this game show. That is very fast. It is so little time, once again, that we could not go to disk drives all of the equivalent of one million books of information were in local memory in that system. It had to have fundamentally 
instant recall of all information at its disposal. So whether it's Homeland Security, massive telcos, or these new analytics operations, uh, it's, it's huge amounts of data and very little time to decide what to do with it. Another example uh, is smarter traffic, uh, where we're talking enormous amounts of data flowing uh, in real time. Uh, 250,000 GPS probes per second in, in an average city. Going back to my comment on and noisy data, uh, I was over in our Dublin lab just a few weeks ago looking in, in the real control center. They have instrumented GPSs on all of their buses around the whole city. And I'm looking at the screen of traffic flow for the whole city of Dublin. And I noticed that two or three of the buses were not only off the road, they were in the rivers. And I said, are you concerned about that? Oh, no, 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 that's just noise. It's a bad GPS system. So you get into these real world applications and often the data is full of extraneous signals, but you don't know whether that's true or not. And so what the system has to do is look at the data around it, look at temporal data before, and try to predict, is that a possible location of that bus? Could it be in the river or not? Do we need to send out you know, a rescue team to, to, uh, to that bus? At the top uh, is this very interesting emerging area of computer science research, where, as I said, we're going to fundamentally learning systems. This is important because we are no longer smart enough to program computer systems to deal with these real world situations. And as I showed you before, we don't have the time to be able to get in there and program or reprogram. The system has to learn based on what it is seeing. So on this journey, uh, the first system that we wanted to create in this regard was this, this Watson system. Uh, we demonstrated it again in, the, in this uh, uh, competition against two human beings. I should first tell you that these two gentlemen, uh, Jennings and, and uh, Rudder, are not normal human beings. Uh, well, they may be in this room, but they're not in, in the world I'm from. Uh, these, these two fellows are incredible. In fact, I, I had a chance to meet with them uh, individually before uh, the actual competition, and I, I asked them, why are you this good? How, how come you're so fast? How, what, how do you study? How do you recall something when you're, when you're asked a question like that? And independently, they both gave me the same answer. They said, we don't study anything. I never sit down and try to learn something. I just remember everything I've seen, read, and heard throughout my life. And I said, well, then how do you, when faced with a question, how does your, your brain work? You know, I'll start to look for associated information, and they say, we don't know. It's just instantly there. It's just instantly there. They have no filing system. The answer is just there, and they trust. They've, they've done this for so long, they trust the information. The answer will be there when presented with a question. So they go into this match. They were extremely confident, let me just say. <laughs> they were extremely confident that no machine was going to beat them. Um, I told them it was just a matter, you know, I knew the, the factors of 1,000. I told them it was not a matter of if it was, it might be a matter of when, but a system is going to beat uh, human beings. So we went up against these two gentlemen, and uh, of course, we're very successful. The system that did this, the system that beat those two uh, uh, very, very bright men uh, was our most powerful commercial, we call it Power 7 system at the time. That system was roughly the size of this entire stage, and it consumed 85,000 watts of electricity. Now, those two human beings, uh, the, your, your brain consumes about 20 watts. So the incredible thing to me is that it took 85,000 watts to beat a QM 40 watt machine. Uh, but that tells us something about we need to do bio-inspired computer science. We need to understand how this does what it does. And if we can do that and cut power consumption and, and do the sorts of reasoning that we can do uh, with, uh, with our brain, we can do some very, very interesting things. This system also had the ability to learn. It was primitive, but it had machine learning. 
if you go back and watch the, the game show, you'll see that as the, as the machine went down these question columns, which were in categories, the machine would become more accurate. And that's because it was learning the relationships within that category as it went down the column. So it learned the context of the question, it learned how its competitors were playing within that column, and it adapted within minutes as it went down that column. What we're doing now is taking that system and applying it to what we think is, is probably one of the most challenging, but perhaps the largest opportunity, and that's healthcare. Uh, we all know that in the healthcare system, uh, the, the number of errors is, 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 is uh, just unacceptable. Uh, we know that the, the cost is unacceptable, and we think that this kind of technology will be uh, a breakthrough technology in healthcare. WellPoint is one of the largest uh, healthcare providers and insurers in, in the United States. We have a very unique partnership where we're applying Watson technology to their massive, massive historical data. We're basically using their historical data of treatments and outcomes to train Watson to not compete with doctors, but assist doctors in diagnosis. And the, the, uh, the pilots that we've run with real world cases, with real world doctors, is astonishing what this system can do. It's astonishing. From there, we're moving on in our research agenda to other forms of inputs, uh, not only voice, uh, voice activated uh, uh, or natural language, but we need to deal with images. The first thing the docs asked us for is, let me feed in the radiological data uh, that we have, uh, the MRIs or, or uh, lab tests into the database that Watson is going to uh, search on. So that, that's a whole area of research. But we think that this kind of uh, capability is gonna literally transform uh, the healthcare system. <clears throat> Moving beyond just the primitive machine learning in Watson, uh, we're, we're doing research in, again, sort of bio-inspired uh, computation. If one looks at uh, uh, neuroscience and one looks at the density of neurons and synapses, uh, big numbers out here, 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 9th. Uh, if we look at the number of nodes we have in our supercomputers, we're sitting, this is a blue gene P. We can roughly, roughly fit a cat's brain into one of our supercomputers, just matching number of neurons and synapses. The exascale system that I showed you, we will be able to mimic in our largest supercomputers the number of neurons and synapses in a human brain. That's the easy part. We do not understand how this is wired. We do not understand fundamentally how the neurons and synapses are behaving. All we know is that they're not they're not ones and zero switches. They're multi-state devices, and they learn over time, and their behavior changes based on what they have experienced. And so using this, uh, again, bio-inspired uh, computer science, uh, we have a program underway in our nanoelectronics uh, area to fundamentally start to build arrays of electronic synapse-like devices so that we can physically mimic the human brain. We're starting with uh, very, very simple devices. The first device we've built is actually with a traditional ones and zeros, a CMOS uh, uh, 45 nanometer device. If I can go back. Uh, we packed all of 256 neurons, not 10 to the 12th, but 256 neurons, uh, 256K, equivalent synapses on a device. We've built this chip, and we've already begun to use this device to recognize images and train images. The next step that we're uh, underway with is to replace the ones and zero synapses with very, very special materials that actually behave like neurons and synapses in that they're multi-state devices. And depending on what the device has seen or how it's been triggered in the past, it will have a different configuration than ones that have never seen or experienced uh, that stimulus or that electric charge. So between what we're doing with computer modeling and what we're doing with physical devices, uh, we're fundamentally on a journey of these so-called learning systems. So in summary, as I stand back, uh, we've gone from 
the early tabulating machines through what we, we have all experienced, which is a computing error, a programmable computing error. Some of us experienced it early with punch card systems. We've all experienced it with PCs. We're now experiencing it with, with mobile devices. But really, we're still within the same regime of computing things or, compu or, or uh, communicating. The world that we're entering in now is, a, is, and we saw a glimpse of it in Watson in that competition with humans, is we're entering a regime now of what I would call smarter systems. And these are systems that can deal with massive amounts of data, data that's moving at incredible rates, data that's ambiguous, and machines that have the ability to learn and recognize patterns and literally become smarter as they have experiences versus are reprogrammed by human beings. As crazy as this may sound, uh, I'm sure that the people who worked in the tabulating era never could have predicted that we would have systems that had exaflop capability that could model molecules and, and predict diseases. So uh, the research that we're doing, again, is the completion of this era moving towards exascale and very, very focused on this area of smarter systems. And so as we establish our global labs, we're looking for the kinds of problems, whether they're natural disaster problems, healthcare problems, et cetera, problems that these kinds of systems will be particularly good at solving, where it's no longer just calculating the answer to some arithmetic problem more quickly. Systems where learning and sensing in real time have tremendous impact on society. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, Dean Economou from NICTA, National ICT Australia. Uh, on, the, on the chips that were simulating the neurons, how are you going to start the patterns of connections? I'm fascinated by that. Is it, are you just going to subject it and hope they connect some way, or is it a, there a starting point? Yeah, we start, we start by just subjecting it uh, through various detector arrays to patterns. And we start to store those patterns on the device. And then the device, uh, through a support computer, begins to uh, overlay new images that it sees and starts to do comparative uh, imaging. And so literally, um, we're, and it's, we're at a very simple stage. I should have brought some of the images where we're, the, the chip is recognizing simple letters. So you can show it portions of a, a letter, and it will recognize that this is an A or this is a B based on the fact that it has seen those shapes before. So right now, it's a very simple comparative uh, technology that we're using. But it, again, it's at very, very low densities. Uh, what we're very interested in doing quickly is building chips out of these multi-state devices um, that we, we know we can build uh, indiscreetly, but we've not yet built arrays of them. Because now we can get uh, finer grain, not only finer pixel grain, uh, but we can get multi-state within a, within a pixel. Thank you. So Hi, I'm Liz Tay from IT News. You mentioned that you'd be looking into the healthcare sector with the Melbourne Research Centre. Um, have you had any problems internationally with getting access to healthcare information and um, how do you plan on getting secondary use access to healthcare data over here? Yeah, it depends on the country we're working in. Um, obviously, in the US or Australia, that we, we, we need the, the data to be sanitized and uh, anonymous uh, if we're going to deal with it. Uh, in other places around the world, uh, that is not the case. So in China, they're very open to sharing uh, healthcare data, so we can do things there much more quickly and easily than we could do um, in uh, the Western world. So we have, to, we have to deal with the privacy issues in, in each country. Uh, Ian Blair. Uh, the question I have is, uh, how are you going to do what the brain does when you combine smell and color and sound 
and images and, and uh, all of those together. That, that strikes me as being fairly difficult. <laughs> Actually, those are very, well, they're, they're complex devices, but they're just analog inputs. They're just signal inputs, and they're actually fairly slow inputs from a computer speed standpoint. So we would our view is the analogy is in the natural system, we want all sorts of sensors out there. We want temperature, pressure, uh, vibration, et cetera. That's no, no different than sort of human sensing. Uh, and these systems will have no difficulty dealing with multiple inputs because they're just analog signals. What we, what we don't know yet is how do those things combine to produce a higher level of knowledge uh, in the brain. And so, you know, when we get these multi-state devices, that's one of the first things we want to start to study is the interaction and overlay of these different senses. As discrete uh, inputs, absolutely no problem, but we believe that there are interactions that we don't understand. Some of the, I, I didn't uh, get into it, but one of the things that's most interesting is, is how is this wired? And one of the, the schematics you saw up there, we, had, we collected all of the discrete work that's been published on uh, monkey brains and how they're, how they're wired. And there's some very interesting uh, wiring patterns that certain things have long-term connectivity versus short-term connectivity that somehow relate to these different areas of the brain that specialize in different senses. So there might be interconnect implications to how we're going to have to interconnect these devices um, to deal with the multi-sensory um, inputs. Whole new area of, of research. Uh, my name is Osofsky. My area is philosophy. It's very well to say that they're all analog input devices, yet touching a soft toy is different to touching one's lover's body. Uh, how would you hand this to the computer? There is a fundamental difference here. In surface texture or firmness or? <laughs> I, one responds differently to one and to the other. So you see, it's not just a straight analog input. Well, again, the sensors and the input is fairly straightforward. What we, again, what we don't understand and where the real interesting research is, is how does the brain learn the difference between those two things? And how does it begin to associate soft from firm with certain kinds of objects? I mean, how do we know that, th I know this table's gonna be firm, right, based on experience. That is a completely new area. There's a lot of brain mapping going on, has gone on with, with in terms of where do certain things reside in the brain, but there's no deep understanding of how those things are stored within synapses and neurons. Thank you. John Wright, you mentioned about sitting in the Dublin Control Centre, seeing the bus in the river. The operator said, that's noise, it's a faulty GPS signal. Right. A, how does the operator know that it's a faulty GPS signal and how does the system then start to learn that it really is faulty and not a real bus? Yeah, um, it, was, it was a scary thought that the operator just sort of threw that data, data out, right? T today they're operating uh, with very primitive uh, optimization programs for traffic. Uh, which n do no, no scrubbing of the data whatsoever. So they're just statistically saying that that's an outlier. Um, we think that through different analytics techniques though, again, looking at last location of that bus, looking at other types of relevant uh, information, we'll be able to tell whether that's an outlier or not. Um, in other areas where it's, say, even more important to know if it's an outlier. Let's say you're talking about cybersecurity, <clears throat> and you have one signal that says something is going on over here in the corner, this database. Uh, this, this piece of information moved from here to here. That normally doesn't occur. And so in this case, we're using analytics to say, okay, w you know, what's the probability that someone interacted with that data? Have we ever seen that movement before? Uh, who moved it? 
did that person have the, the right and the wherewithal to, and the authorization to move that piece of information? So in the area of cybersecurity, we're looking at other types of information to determine whether that's an outlier, whether it's noise, or whether it's signal. Uh, and there are cases through, you know, basically every industry of that kind of thing. I, I use the bus because it's a very visual uh, thing. But we're going to have to more and more distinguish between signal and noise in these real world uh, situations. And we're exploring and doing research on all the analytics techniques to try to sort through, through that. Noisy data in these real world situations is, I think, the biggest problem we're going to face. We'll build the computer systems that'll be big enough and fast enough to deal with it. But the noise is going to be something that we're going to really be challenged to handle. <clears throat> particularly if we want to tease low-level signal out of all that noise. Now, there's a lot of analogies in the electrical engineering world for the electrical engineers in the world, the techniques to do that. And we're going to have to apply those, I think, to this new domain of noisy data. So the research needed to move towards a human brain is, is in one direction, but to solve the Dublin traffic problem is quite different, and, and humans are not very good at that. Is it a completely different direction of research, or are they all part of the same ultimate system? Uh, different, but I think different, different in time. Like the cognitive work is, is very long-term research. We, we believe that that is where these smart systems are going. But these systems are decades away. I mean, true cognitive systems are decades away. The real world problems we're dealing with now, the, the, the bus in the river, we need to deal with now. So we need new algorithms, new techniques to sort through, filter this data, looking for signal versus noise today. And you can go through every level of uh, system problem that we're dealing with, and we're seeing this same pattern. Um, in the earlier symposium, I think it was coming up routinely that we're getting you know, very, very noisy uh, information. We see it in the, the large telecommunications, the carriers. Uh, when they're dealing with billions of records per day, there's tremendous noise in that, that data set. And as they're trying to decide what to do with their network and how to bill and how to change their marketing programs, there's huge amounts of noise in that data. And so we're trying to invent new algorithms to deal with that in real time with today's systems. But they're all, I think, um, dealing with directionally large analytics problems. I mean, really the kinds of problems we're talking about with those smart systems are analytics type problems, where you have massive amounts of information and you're trying to sort through it. So directionally the same, but different, totally different time scales. Peter, the last question for you. Peter, Peter. Um, very interested also in, in the concept of the biological computing and mimicking the brain and the chips that you're having, which presumably will have considerable flexibility in them like the brain does. What you're doing now, I think, is, is assuming that you can expose those chips to experience. They learn from that experience and therefore become more powerful. That's true of the brain. A, a more experienced brain is a more powerful brain to a point at which stage it starts to age. Now, I don't know if there's a relationship between experience, the number of signals that come in, and the fact that it ages itself, but it's a very simple question. Do you think there's a chance that if you design these machines, they may in fact themselves age? No. That's a, uh, that is a very good question. I hadn't thought that through. Um, I suppose there's a, there's a chance that they will, uh, just as the human brain, uh, gets in, we'll get into uh, recognizing patterns and that pattern will become the, the dominant theory and, and will start to bias the system. Um, there are techniques to deal with that. The, the Watson machine is uh, one of the fundamental decisions we made with the Watson machine which made it so powerful relative to other people who have attempted to do this, is it uses very, very few rules and very, very few predetermined pieces of information. It takes every question and statistically wipes the slate clean and goes out and searches. 
and comes up with a, a statistical answer to whatever it's asked. And it will come up with three or four and say, I'm 95% confident it's this, 60% this, this, and this. Starting with a completely new calculation. We did that because it was too easy for the system to become biased. Interestingly, if you, if you look at healthcare, that is one of the phenomena in healthcare that becomes a problem. The, the docs, as they start to see the same, the same disease, chances are they'll diagnose you just based on what they last saw, right? We think that Watson is going to have a huge advantage in healthcare because it will start you as a completely new statistical analysis. It will, not, it will have a record of previous, but it will weight that equivalent to every other new piece of information available. So some of these statistical techniques we should be able to use in these uh, new types of chips to make sure that it doesn't over-recognize uh, and become trapped in its own learnings. But that's a very good question. Extremely fortunate this evening to hear from Dr. Kelly to get, I think, a sense of how analytics and high-end computing now interact with a set of substantial policy and human problems uh, and offer the prospect of very different ways of framing responses and changing our world. So on behalf of the University of Melbourne, can I say thank you very much.